14th? November 14th is a conference called Disrupt Up. Um, I think I said that right. <laughs> uh, AI conference here in Roanoke. So uh, everything, all things AI. So this is a little bit of a primer. So this is just a little bit of an appetite for what she's going to be covering in November. So pay attention. I'll turn it over to Erin. Thank yeah. you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Brad. <clears throat> um, thank you all for being here. This is an exciting topic. We have so many companies that are, are wrestling with this who are integrating AI and really interesting, uh, creative ways. It's really disrupting a lot of our different types of technology. Um, just a, a note on the conference. As we started putting together this very technical conference and we started recruiting people with the title of Director of AI for X company, large companies, the global company. And when we would ask them to be a speaker of ours, they'd say, well, we don't have all the answers. I'm like, well, your, your title is <laughs> Director of AI. And as we get into it more and more, they're like, we actually are really excited to attend and be with this other speaker because we feel like they might have a piece to this puzzle that we don't have. So what the emerging theme of our conference is, this could be kind of an epicenter of innovation, bringing academics and industry experts and people who are integrating in AI and to see what can come out of it. So in our portfolio, we have Ramp, Gabbett is our instructor for Ramp, our Technology Biotech Accelerator, but thinking about how we bring together the right people, create really interesting intellectual property around emerging technology. So super excited to be here. We have a great lineup. They're the experts. I'm just the convener. But we're going to go start off with introductions and just a really interesting way you're connected to AI right now. And we'll dive into some interesting conversations. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, some of you were at my prior session, but just to say hello again, Rishi Jaitley, uh, I'm on the faculty here at Virginia Tech, where I'm the founder of the Institute for Leadership and Technology. We offer an executive humanities degree to technology leaders around the world. And I'm also an advisor to OpenAI, which is my fun connection to, to the AI world. And I've spent a lot of the last year helping OpenAI launch or learn about, think about, and, and begin to launch in emerging markets in Asia Pacific. And so that's, that's sort of my orientation or a little bit of the hat I wear in the ecosystem. Great to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm the number one person on the leaderboard right now. <laughs> I don't expect that to still last. It's just kind of a game. It's like a to play. Yeah, the, my name is Ken Davidian. I'm retired. So I used to work at NASA. I used to work at FAA. I did PhD research on industry emergence of the suborbital um, space industry segment. Um, in the last five, six, seven years, I've been working with the, um, Dr. Townsend and his AI and uh, technology strategy uh, course as a distance learning instructor, which means I'm a glorified TA. Um, but I've been using, for the last two years, whenever ChatGPT went public, wow. I've been using ChatGPT and I've been trying to use the different AIs to, to, to see what they, how they work and whatnot. So I'm coming at it more from a super, what I would consider a more practical approach. You know, all these considerations of, oh, proprietary information, which is really big in the international space industry. A lot of the space, well, NASA won't. A lot of the companies that are involved with uh, space exploration and high tech are not putting their stuff into AI without having the enterprise sort of firewalls put up um, around it. So a lot of, when I did a very informal poll at a meeting last year in Paris, <laughs> I said, how many people are using it? And not and it's the high tech industry, right? We're supposed to be forward leaning and innovative. Boom, nothing. And it's like me and like two other young people. And you hate to say it's young people only because it's not an age thing necessarily. They're just a lot, a lot less afraid, you know. And Mark Twain said, to be successful, you need to be um, enthusiastic and ignorant. So <laughs> uh, I think you know, I fall into those categories, both of those categories. So, right there. I'm sorry, Brian. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, my name is Matt Bernito. I'm the CEO and founder of the AI Advisory Group. Um, we have uh, some former Fortune 100 and 500 chief data officers um, providing fractional and advisory um, executive consulting um, for a lot of Fortune 500 and mid-cap companies. I've been in the space, oh, God, 20, 23 years. Uh, this is the first time I built the data science model. Playing to fame, I guess, would be winning NVIDIA's Partner of the Year Award and being their uh, chair for a couple of years. So I'm Spencer Leamy. I'm the founder of a startup company here in Blacksburg called Corvus Labs. 
we actually work on uh, robotics. Uh, my background is more multi-robot <laughs> autonomy. I come from AI, much more from the vision side. Um, and I started embracing the use of, of language models more uh, to do more in less time. Uh, I embrace laziness. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. Uh, some of my favorite people um, in the AI space uh, get to, to chat with, so this will be fun. Um, Ken is going to be on his phone constantly trying to stay number one. Um, he's been teaching with me for six years, and he's much more than a glorified TA. He's been an amazing uh, partner in that course. Um, so my day job, I'm a professor at uh, Virginia Tech in the Pamphlet School of Business. Uh, I am an academic director of the entrepreneurship program. So we have undergraduate, master's, PhD courses. Uh, my research area is in the intersection of AI and entrepreneurship. And so we work on a lot of projects, both from an empirical standpoint, but also uh, theoretical to try to understand, grapple with the implications um, of AI. I'm also editor of a couple different platforms. Um, one is called EIX.org. Our sister platform is familybusiness.org. Uh, we are still literally growing 50% year over year. So the projected numbers this year is about 22 million readers. And so we take academic articles, we translate them for practicing entrepreneurs. And so part of my mandate is kind of building an AI first model with this. Um, so Dick Schultz is our benefactor, the guy who started Best Buy. And um, so he funds us. So it's a completely free publishing platform. And uh, we use that to, again, to try to connect entrepreneurs with uh, um, you know, with academic researchers around the world. I built one of the first graduate courses in artificial intelligence and entrepreneurship. And so we just finished our fourth iteration of that. That's been quite interesting um, to see. Some fantastic students have gone through people launching companies and and, and kind of working on uh, various projects. So uh, this will be a really fun panel. I've got some great Bayesian jokes. It's been served. It's really great hearing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, he's did not want to sit by me since I'm really regretting life choices. Right now. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you. My Love Business panel is made up of academics, uh, professionals, startups, practitioners, lots of different angles. So I'm excited to hit it from uh, multiple uh, opinions and multiple perspectives. Um, starting off, thinking about what, in your opinion, AI is not a new technology, but it has advanced really quickly over the last couple of years. What are some of the most significant advancements? And let's say the last two or three years in your industry or from where you sit in AI. Sure. I mean, I uh, <laughs> I'll start by, you know, so though I'm an advisor at OpenAI, I, I don't know everything going back to how you open, but you know, for me at least, given that my role at the company and a lot of my career I've spent uh, overseas as an expat, I think what's really heartening mm -hmm. to see is how much two things I'd say. One is how much, how many innovation ecosystems around the world are asking and attempting to answer these questions on AI, how many countries are beginning to think about sovereign AI, how many countries are beginning to think about um, all elements of the AI stack. I think that's, um, that kind of ambition is um, not inevitable. And so I think, um, I, I think for me, that the number of countries thinking about AI from a public policy standpoint is novel. The second thing I'll say is, you know, when I was at Google uh, in the late 2000s, you know, a lot of governments weren't really thinking about technology policy. Technology policy historically lagged behind the innovation ecosystems. Here, you have civil society and government actually leading in many ways. Um, and I think that's, that's different too. So my starting points would be that the barriers to entry are flat that countries around the world, including emerging markets, are leaning in, and that public policy and the role of public institutions is not passive, but far more active. And and I and it's, you know, the experience of sitting in it, sitting at OpenAI the last year is one in which the company sometimes I feel like is over-rotated to interactions with public institutions. And that's very different historically from you know global Silicon Valley, which has historically been leave us alone, stay away, public institutions. In this case, there's a race towards public institutions, which feels different and may be a helpful starting point for my contribution to the panel. So over the last couple of years, and I'll represent the space industry because that's where I came out of, um, the international space industry is dominated by government activities. And two thirds of, at least in the United States, of the space industry is defense department. So it's a large fraction of that. We don't even know what they're doing. Um, the adoption of AI is a super scary thing. 
I think for a lot of these companies that surround this whole government space ecosystem, and, it's, and the government just, I mean, I worked for the government for 34 years, so let me just say the government moves slowly. They take into consideration a lot of people's opinions that might not be super well informed, but they have power over the process. And so it's been a really, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. They really have not embraced it because it's different, it's wrong. I mean, the space industry has been using, I was using an, something called a product called Key, uh, which was a, a, a knowledge framework uh, product back in the late 80s, early 90s, writing in Lisp and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, and I, I'm not an AI expert. I don't consider myself an AI uh, you know, worker, but it's so different now and people are afraid to use it. I would say they're just afraid to use it. So, um, and until all of those kind of barriers come down, the, the permission is given to government officials and government organizations to use it. You know, they're just going to be doing the same thing as that they've always done. So, they know it's there. But again, I'm I'm really shocked at the lack of adoption. And I've been pushing it here. All my panels, I've been encouraging folks to use the LLMs. And so, yeah. Um. Yeah, it's really interesting because if you look at a lot of the Fortune 500, they have data science teams, and if you look at workloads, 60 to 80 percent are machine learning, um, just called structured data for the sake of argument. And what I loved about ChatGPT's advent um, back in November, um, a couple of years ago now, is that that UI experience meant it was accessible to everyone because. Back a couple of years ago, for anybody in the data space, you were Harry Potter in a broom closet. You're not allowed out. Nobody's letting you out unless maybe you get to eat or go talk to one person and then back you go, right? It's been this siloed mechanism for so long. And now you have organizations that the boards of directors, the C-suite are saying, we need a generative AI strategy. And while it's maybe the way, wrong way to phrase that, it's really how do we use AI? How do we use generative AI? to help transform our organization. And so the societal change and the potential impact around this and the excitement from the general population, not just those in the data space, is where I'm really seeing the transformation. So even though the majority of ROI is coming from, yes, machine learning, deep learning models, there's gonna be this other side of like return on employee in regards to more engagement, more time back to spend on the things that matter by using these types of automations. So, yeah, I very much echo uh, what Matt was just saying in the sense of this kind of widespread adoption of uh, chat GPT has kind of had uh, a ancillary benefit uh, for people like me who come more out of the computer vision AI world where, uh, you know, a lot of people would <laughs> essentially be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. How is this useful? Like all, all of this stuff. Now all of a sudden they're like, hey, AI is actually giving me productivity gains. And that shift in perspective is really leading to benefit not only within large language models, but uh, within other applications of AI. It's being taken much more seriously. People are starting to see return on investment that has been promised for 40, 50 years. And now it's finally happening. And that opens up a lot more opportunity, I would say. Um, and then the, the second biggest part is really kind of low level bureaucratic tasks, low level engineering tasks, like specifically within code generation, you get a lot more velocity because one person can do so much more. And that's very much in line with what you were talking about in terms of more return on per employee. And a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, we're worried about AI taking our jobs and everything. And it's like, no, the people that you have right now can just do so much more. And it increases your quality of life in many ways, because when you used to have to take kind of unstructured data notes from a meeting and then put it in a form, you can automate a lot of those tasks nowadays. And that's really <coughs> becomes a much more natural way of doing business. Yeah, I think this usability, especially from an entrepreneurship perspective, is crucial, right? Because again, there's a lot of really sophisticated engineering that goes on in companies that are deploying models and in various contexts. And you know, the Chat GPT interface and you know the the API yeah. framework, right? I mean, I always joke with my students say it's like for me, coding is like I'm a chimpanzee and a mechanical typewriter. I mean, I'm not that's not my my skill set. And the fact that I have an intelligence that's an API call away that I can prompt. 
rather than having potentially hundreds or thousands of lines of code to try to specify exactly what I want my code to be able to do. I have a prompt that I'm designing a personality, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm giving it instructions, but an intelligent um, or an intelligence can respond to is pretty wild and pretty fascinating. And, uh, and I think the implications of that as we start to diffuse that through various mechanisms in organizations is pretty profound, right? So we do a lot of research on this and we're studying sort of early stage impacts. We're starting to see in certain companies um, I'll just tell you, if you go to the pitch competition, a little plug for that tomorrow, we actually have an experiment running behind the scenes with the students. We're giving them access to different tools, um, uh, different agents that we built that have different temperature settings, which affects the creativity of the output um, and some of these advisory tools. And so we'll start to see some of those ideas, how they were shaped by some of these, I mean, I'll call rudimentary now AI tools that we have deployed in this, this process. Right. We're seeing productivity gains in some spaces between 25 to 70 percent, right, on certain tasks. And again, in our mindset, it's like, okay, that, you know, there's a lot of hyperbole in the AI space right now. But when you start to look at, like, the industrial revolution, you start to look at, like, connecting the manufacturing plant to mm -hmm. some type of uh, machinery, right, that can, can drive it. So it's not human labor um, that's actually driving the machines anymore. Generally, it's about a 25 percent increase. Right in productivity, and so we start to extrapolate what happened with the industrial revolution with AI. If we start to see some of these productivity gains across lots of different use cases, and we're talking about 70, 80 percent. And Matt was telling us some of the things the way he's automating his firm. So, you know, definitely would love to hear more as he talks about that. You're seeing, you know, massive amounts of labor hours being completely automated with, you know, again, I'll use the word intelligence, and I understand that that's, you know, quite the controversial, but it is much more sophisticated than certainly the code I was developing in my Jupyter notebooks, which are a giant mess. So, yeah. <laughs> and one more thing. Um, Jump in. I think, yeah, especially because this is an entrepreneurial group, one of the things that I absolutely love with the advent of this too is that if you're not a coder, but you have a bright, brilliant idea, you can actually use this to augment what you're trying to do. You can build an MVP yourself without having to find like a technical co-founder. And what this is leading to, in my opinion, just from like that automation side, um, is that like my CTO built an application in three days that would have taken a team of three, 12 right. weeks to do, right? Which means that if we're going to get all this time back, we're at the greatest inflection point in history for small, medium businesses and mid-sized businesses to cannibalize market share from large companies that are too slow to pivot. Yeah, I think that's, let's keep referring. So thinking about productivity, I loved your uh, return on the employee, how much more you can get out of an employee with AI. Let's keep working on Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, one helpful frame I've sort of used is, you know, skinny versus strong replacement versus ROI. I think a year and a half ago when GPT came out, a lot of the narrative was sort of around our company's going to shrink by 20%, are we going to be replaced? I think what we're seeing is a framing around, you're going to get 20% more out of your people, you're going to get more ROI out of people. And I think that's a frame that I use to, you know, that, that, I, that I find is helpful to, to track yeah. as these as these things evolve. And um, certainly even inside of OpenAI, I mean, on the software side is, is where I see sort of the most bang for your buck uh, from these technologies. But um I hope that's a helpful framing device in terms of how, how these things evolve in the future. The only thing I would add is that it doesn't do great at everything, right? So you've got, so what they're talking about is, I mean, I spent four hours one, it was like, I was, I was in jet lag. So I was playing with chat. We <clears throat> ran this about a year ago. So probably generations of capability away, but I was asking it to write a program for me, code, Hey code, I want to evaluate all my Wordle screenshots. And keep a database of all the words that I've done and on the tree of above above. Can I love? I thought it would come up. <laughs> well, but it should be able to do it. Like take these graphics, find it, tell me if it's green or yellow, what the letters are. It should be able to do that, right? But it was I spent four hours that I was going, okay, now I'm done doing this. I loaded Python on my machine and virtual blah blah blah. So so it does some things really, really well. The other day I was asking it to do some advanced algebra. Two digit, three digit numbers times two digit and three digit numbers, and it was hallucinating left and right. Um, Anthropic did okay on one example, but not another example. So now I can't trust it on math, 
Um, I've used it to write proposals, but only because I know what needs to be, because I was smart enough to be able to guide it, I could do that. But if somebody just says, hey, I'm gonna write a proposal for this, you end up with a shell of a report that kind of is super general and, you know. So you gotta, for me, it serves three major purposes. One is as a research assistant, which it sucks right now, and it might get better. <laughs> One is as an administrative assistant, which is really, I think it does pretty darn well in summarizing things. And third is as an artistic <laughs> assistant. So if you need drawings, if you need poems, I've introduced panels using limericks based on their public facing bios, <laughs> and you just feed that into ChatGPT and say, but, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, write a limerick and not to introduce this person, and everybody on the panel loves their limerick. I mean, so I could not do that in drawing pictures, of course. So, I think it does good at some things, and hopefully the things it doesn't do well at, it will get better over time. Hey, Spencer, I want to uh, pull you in. As a startup, you only have a couple employees. What are you, two or three now? Yeah. And so I guess part time, but it's just think about yeah. the the work you're doing. You have contracts coming at you. You have so much uh, that you want to achieve. How you're incorporating AI in your so, workflow? Like well, one of the ways that. Uh, Go into the the proposal generation. I, I'm absolutely with you that it is not great at a lot of things, and especially when it comes to things like true mathematical reasoning, doing proofs on its own. But I, I look at these as more a lever than anything else. And it's if you know what you're doing, you ha can gain a lot more momentum. <laughs> velocity. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I, I was just talking about this earlier. One of the big um, I'm going to say uh, gains that I got was we hooked up, uh, we built an open source uh, web conferencing, hooked up our own uh, large language model from Meta. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I want to pay API costs if I can. Uh, but uh, hooked up our own uh, large language model that not only summarized our conversation, but we, uh, we were doing a, a DOD submission. DOD submissions are very much formulaic. They're like, this is going to be the structure, this is the format, and you have to answer these questions. And a lot of times, uh, you know, the problems that I have is I'll write something, then I want to add one word, and like, oh, now I've changed the context, now I've had more, and then I go back, and I'm like, nobody understands this, so i got to start all over again. And that kind of, that really, like, takes up a lot of time, and that's not necessarily valuable time. It's just a simple communication problem. So what we did was we had the form, the structure, we're like, okay, this is going to be the format. And then we created, you know, five personas or so, right? And then I just got on uh, a conference call with one of my employees and we just went through the submission and talked about it and had all of our previous writings that were relevant to it and everything. Um, and then after the end of that meeting within, you know, a half hour, we didn't just have one five page white paper. We had five five page white papers from different perspectives with different tones and everything. And then you're able to pick and choose kind of uh, the different kind of, uh, you know, paragraphs, writing styles that you like, bring that all together. And then you're done with a five page white paper that normally would have taken me a week, maybe two, and would have, you know, slowed other things down in a single day, in a single afternoon. And then, you know, it's just a matter of reviewing it, sending it off to, you know, uh, <laughs> other people to make sure it's still understandable and everything. Because at the end of the day, you still have to provide the, the high level knowledge. You're not going to get away from it. These are not like, I. Uh, other people will disagree with me, but I uh, AI is just data compression and curve fitting. Right. It's just been trained on the entire internet, compress that all together. And when you're choosing a persona, really what you're doing is choosing some well represented curve or some, you know, kind of uh, estimation of a, of a curve of somebody's specific tone. I mean, depending on how biased the model is and everything, a lot of training that can go into that aspect. But that that's really like the the types of value that I get out of it is just I can I'm not depending on the AI to do my work, but it allows me to do it so much faster when I know what I want to do, right? Spencer, you're a very technical founder. Um, thinking about people who are leading companies, leading teams who aren't as technical and aren't as well-versed in AI, what is advice to, do you give leaders on how they can upskill? How, how do they learn about AI in a productive way that they can empower their employees to use AI? 
oh, is this for me again? Yeah. Anybody who wants to <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely something, you know, I get a lot of questions regarding it, but there is still some confusion in language and that, that is going on. And, and, and people are rightfully nervous about some of this stuff. They're, they feel intimidated by it, that it's very technical. But going back to what you, the very first thing you said, the UI, uh, I definitely view large language models as the next generation interface to the computer, to accessing these tools, right? Like one of the best benefits you have is not having it write a program from scratch, but taking code that already exists, like operations research tools and different things like that, that you can go and provide it kind of the constraints. You can make it generate code within that framework based on a lot of different examples. So you're not depending on the reasoning of the model itself. You're just using this language model as a tool maker, right? So it's a better hand hammer in it. All right. So Spencer uh, is talking to all of our technical CEOs in the room now. Rishi, will you? Yeah, I would say. I would, for everybody I would, I would say you know, as a leader of teams myself, I you know, I, I would avoid trying to be too prescriptive about rules of the road at this stage. I think the best. I think what I would encourage leaders to do is embrace and set a tone of of experimentation. I mean, we. I, for instance, have, tr have trained a GPT on my writing style. I've gone ahead and done it. I've fed it all kinds of documents I've written over the last 20 years, and there's a GPT that sits with me. I don't use it all the time, but, but I've set a tone on the teams I lead across a range of initiatives I oversee of, this is, this is a dynamic space. I'm going to experiment and um, and I think the best organizations, be they in the Fortune 100 or small non nonprofits, are resisting the temptation to say, we need a, we need a, a rules of the road document today, uh, because the dynamic is changing um, over and over again. And, and similarly, you see this around the world where the use cases keep changing. And I see this with governments I talk to around the world as well, where you know, a use case, let's say in biotech that didn't exist six months ago, now exists today. A lot of people want to declare their major immediately around do's and don'ts or use cases to invest in. I would I would just encourage a culture of experimentation as a leader. To riff on the idea of experimentation, one of the experiments I did was I took some text that I had written. And it's one of the problems that I've always had in my career is not in the transmission of information. I can talk all day but everybody in this room is gonna hear the message differently, right? So you're all hearing it through your own perspective. So the, the translation aspect of it is very important. So I use ChatGPT to do the translation. So this gets into the thing where I was asking it at one point, I was saying, number one, here's my text. Tell me what the flesh Kincaid score is of this, grade level of this is, the, the complexity of, of the writing, and then rewrite it at a different flesh Kincaid score. After a while, it stopped and I told it, I said, go to Wiki, here's the formula for Flesh Kincaid. And after about a week, it stopped being able to do that. It was giving me the numbers. I'm not sure how good they were, but it was giving me numbers. So then I had to revert back to write it so that a five-year-old can understand it, for a 10-year-old, for a 12, 11 year old And using different vocabularies, for me, the inflection point was around 10 and 11 years old, I think, where it started getting too flowery or whatever, maybe it was great. But but so you got to find where that, that point is. you got to experiment with it to find where the thing is. I did the same thing with my own writing style. Um, but I also, in my readings about, like FDR would give his speech writing group some guidance on how he wanted his speeches written. Ooh, cut and paste that into chat GPT. Now I've got an FDR style. You've got a smart brevity style. The guys that put it go that started Axios, you know, they they wrote a book on how to make a punchy little post. Boom, stick that wrote those rules in there. Now I can write in smart brevity style. You know, so you just have to experiment with it and and just not be afraid with it. I'm afraid of it. Yeah, I think that looking at it two different ways. There's the personal and there's the company side. On the personal, if you haven't used it, use it. Right, practice makes perfect. If you do a sales call for the very first time, you're going to suck at it, right? Uh, if you do it a thousand times, you're going to be much better at it. And language is so, so, so critically important with any of these LMs, obviously. Uh, to the extent that you need to be able to really articulate what you're trying to do, right? If you say, write a strategy document, it's going to be just repetitive paragraph blurbs that are not innovative at all. If you ingest your own writing or thinking um, into that, if you say use bullet points, whatever it is that you want to do from a structural perspective or what target audience, who you are, what that identification is, what you're trying to accomplish, 
all of that going into the prompt creates much, much stronger prompts. So that's the personal side that use it, use it, use it. You'll get better and better and better. The more you read, the more you write, the better you get. The company side, uh, there's a couple different components. So if you're looking what to do now or first, the majority of organizations that are seeing what you would call an ROI around LLMs is with RAG, um, which is basically FAQs, um, chatbots, essentially, right? Um, so being able to just ingest all of your company's information, product manuals, whatever the heck it is, and have people be able to interact with the chatbot, right? That's the fastest path to what you can call innovation, right? And that's like a crawl-based approach. But what I think we're really going to see is this threefold approach in regards to company acceleration. The first will be digital twins, which will be a reflection of who you are, which will be trained on really, really large language models. The second will be precise small language agents, which, you know, if you need a sales agent or you need a virtual agent or you need a marketing agent or you need a coding agent, they'll be able to do that much more effectively. And then the third piece, which you're going to see, which is what we do internally, is LLMs embedded into workflows. So instead of like trying to manually copy and paste this transcript and ask it to run this prompt, we have all that embedded, right? And so it will flow like, let's say for post sales calls, flow from our CRM into large language models to provide the action items, uh, an email blurb write up, like all the things that I actually need to both be prepared for a call and make sure things get done, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about the human productivity and being able to do the things that matter, like building relationships or being able to be here with you guys, as opposed to manually doing a bunch of crap with technology that frustrates us. Matt, I love that you talk about the integration of AI into the workflow. Dave, I want to ask you, what are some considerations that the leader, the teams need to consider as they adopt AI and start to put them into their workflows? Yeah, let me reiterate a point I think that's really important about experimentation. Right? One of the big projects we're working on, you know, of course it's academics, we use, you know, try to use overly um, abstract language to confuse people. Yeah, we all should. And, you know, we, uh, you know, call it epistemic risk, right? But we, we kind of juxtapose this idea of hallucinations versus really in minds, right? And there's this jagged edge problem in, in large language models that they can be really good at some things and really terrible at others, but they're like an adjacent space, right? So you think, okay, it's really good at this, like, and then all of a sudden, I move it to this use case, which is just maybe changing something very slight and 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 the parameters of a use case, and then what the heck is that? You know, what what kind of output do I have? So I think that experimentation is is really really important. Um, you know, to so you all, you know, in your daily work. I mean, it's always interesting because I always assume, and I have my students. Again, you know, we don't make it a mandate, but I structure assignments and in, in programs that they really have to use the tools because what we're asking them to do would be really impossible if they're trying to do it themselves. And so the tools then are basically put in a position or they're put in a position that the tools are what's gonna allow them to be productive enough to meet the expectations of the assignment. Part of that's just, you know, the way that we, we structure learning, right? So it's, you know, those, that experimentation is crucially important because you have to start to develop somewhat of an intuition, but also hold that intuition in check because things are changing so rapidly behind the scenes, um, you know, I've seen people all the time, like they'll do something and, oh, this is terrible. Like, what were you using? Like GPT-2, okay, nobody uses GPT-2 <laughs> anymore. In fact, they, they sort of closed off the API um, for it. I mean, as we keep scaling these models, they, the capabilities tend to get better. So that's important. So the specific things I think is to have some intentionality clearly about what you're doing. And I always sort of compare it, you know, I'm a parent, we've got, four boys. My wife says she's raising five boys before she gave birth to, um, you know, but, you know, you think about how you structure things for your kids. And this always seems to be a useful heuristic for me, right? There's a difference between what you'd give a 14 year old versus a 24 year old in terms of specific task and latitude. And I think this is the part of it because one of the most interesting dynamics right now are AI agents. And that's an area that we're starting to really look at. So Replit, if you haven't really experimented, it's one platform I'd strongly encourage you to go check out because it's a prompt structure that builds an agent behind the scenes that can do something, right? So it's basically, essentially, um, you're doing a chat GPT, but it's put within some kind of a framework that allows that agent to take action to do something, right? So it can build an app for you. And, you know, so some of the stuff we're gonna do in the next couple of weeks 
we're going to build them live, which is always really dangerous when you're presenting is to have something, you know, being built live behind the scenes, but we'll do it, right? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you, you, you kind of go through the thing. So be intentional about how you structure, how you delegate, how you organize tasks. But the biggest thing I think for a lot of people, again, this is sort of this deep concern people have about it, and they come up with all sorts of examples of hallucination problems and, and other issues, is that you got to also allow the, you know, whether it's a large language model or whatever the particular tool is to actually be successful. Right? And so I think this is sort of an interesting dynamic that a lot of people are hobbling these systems in a way that actually create problems, right? And so it's like, if you're looking for political bias in a large language model output, you're absolutely going to find political bias because your prompt invoked that political bias, right? It's a dyadic relationship that there's or, or sort of a relational dialogue that's happening here and so you've got to be able to delegate and understand kind of what you're specifically looking for and so one of the heuristics we're starting to use is thinking about hiring ai when do you hire ai right and so to sort of think about jobs as bundles of tasks what kind of bundles of tasks when multi-modal systems are starting to emerge can be done with this you start to use that heuristic how then is you as a ceo or a manager would think about hiring an employee and structuring job design. Um, you know, we don't know what kind of incentives these AI agents are going to respond to. Um, you know, right now you think nothing, right? It's it's not that intelligent. <clears throat> That's probably true. But you know, are there ways in which now there's an allocation of compute resources, right? Where there's competition across agents, right? So we've got these models that we're starting one of we use is called the garbage can model right it's a very famous um, organization theory model so we're building a garbage can model for ai agents because it's all about how to allocate attention time and resources um, to understand like what's the organizational system structure going to look like and so again think about from a parent perspective and i think that gives you some intuition uh, well from the parent perspective and, and the idea of hiring an ai ai number one we talk about hallucinations everything ai gives you is a hallucination Everything, 100% is a hallucination. Some of it's more realistic than others, but it's all a hallucination. It does not care about truth, but for those of you who remember the Colbert Report, it cares about truthiness. <laughs> That's it. So I would never hire somebody like that, but I use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Let's switch from the leadership team, kind of manager mode to the creative side, the R&D team. How is AI sparking innovation? within startups, within established global Fortune 500 companies? How is it disrupting the system? Well, I think one way to think about this is minimizing um, duplicative work around the world. So I've talked to a lot of scholars around the world who say that particularly in R&D, there's lots of overlap. So a scholar in Boston might be interrogating a similar question to a scholar in in Beijing or in Tokyo. Um, and if you can train a system on existing research already done on a particular topic, let's say in cancer research, that system may help tell you where to aim, right? And so the scholars I talk to talk about um, the there's less redundancy now in disparate innovation ecosystems. And I think that to me leads to one of the more interesting questions to ask in and around generative AI which is what is rate limiting? Meaning here we are sort of 14, 18 months into this wave of generative AI. And a question to ask is how do these things get better? And there are lots of answers to that question, right? There's electricity, power, and energy. There's chips, uh, you know, so the extent to which companies have access to chips is a big driver of productivity. But ultimately, I think the most interesting observation I've had watching the ecosystem is data. There's a real, you know, each one of these companies playing in and around LLMs has got its own data advantage. Uh, they've already trained their systems on the entire internet. What's left? And so I think therein lies the answer that if you can train bespoke systems on otherwise proprietary data inside your companies, inside universities, inside startup ecosystems, you can actually unlock new answers that haven't yet been perhaps unlocked by how far systems have gotten to today. And, you know, the companies right now are running around the world looking for new data. But I, these are some of the themes I've picked up in and around innovation and creativity ecosystems. 
think one of the wild you know, parts of this, like my doc, my main doctoral student is part of her dissertation is looking at, you know, creativity and, and these systems. And uh, so one of the things we do, you know, behind the scenes, right? If you know the algorithm, I mean, functionally, you're just manipulating a temperature setting, right? So the temperature setting is what we have to overly simplify it, but you're you're mm -hmm. you're introducing randomness into the system, right? So instead of essentially, you know, again, next token prediction, we call next word prediction a large language model. Like I say a word, there's another word in the English language, depending on context, that's most likely under very precise settings, that's the word that's fit. Again, I know I'm, I'm sort of oversimplifying this. Manipulate temperature settings, that allows for, you know, basically, you know, functionally changes that statistical distribution. So then you get, you know, much more quote unquote creativity but it's sort of random, if you will, right? And and it's not necessarily there. So we've had it kind of go through sort of an ideation agent to come up with different ideas and we changed the temperature settings. And so one of the particular ones that spit out was um, using uh, mycelium basically to create temporary shelters for um, large festivals, right? So basically using mushrooms, roots of mushrooms to create these facilities. I have no freaking idea if that's a legitimate idea or not, but it, it was able to highlight sort of some of the called genetic engineering, if you will, that would need to happen in order to, to sort of manipulate that type of material to produce this particular use case. So this is where we talk about this alien minds problem is that even the sophistication where they're at right now, and, and they're very sophisticated, but not as much as, you know, maybe we would assume or we would want, it still could push past the boundaries of what we think is possible, right, in a given situation. So our creativity is human based on our experience, our understanding, training, all those things. These systems could push very past, very quickly past those boundaries in a, in a way that actually uh, can create some of these, you know, again, we call them epistemic risks, some of these problems for us, right? So when I talk about type one, type two errors, do we either reject um, something that was a legit idea or we pursue something that was completely ridiculous. And that's what we're starting to kind of see. So one of my colleagues in, in Britain, he's got this basic idea, very counterintuitive right now, that essentially humans can't compete. There is a Turing creativity test and some of the state of the state of the art models have actually um, far passed any human, right? We're basically not even close human performance, right? well past human performance in terms of, you know, some of the specific creative tasks. Now that's not all of creativity, but it is there. And so it is going to be, how do we functionally then work with systems that are far more creative? It could push past our epistemic boundaries much faster than we anticipate and in much more aggressive ways. And I think it's a, it's kind of, I mean, as a scholar, it's an exciting problem. Maybe as a human, it's kind of terrifying, but yeah. you know, we'll see. Well, yeah. I think creativity is a, creativity is a really unique perspective, really unique word in the sense that We've been thinking, or at least how this was originally created, you look at like the mid-journey stable diffusion, any of the art models of the world, is that, oh, well, this can take artist jobs, right? And there were even contests where AI art is was and is being banned. But the creative element is what makes us human, right? It's the, the technology, it's the enablement tool. But not everyone's an artist, not everyone's a musician, right? And, but if you have something in your mind that you really want to do, you want to create some really unique music out there, there's tools and platforms that can allow you to create what you envision, right? Without you having to necessarily have the base requisite skill set of using technologies like Ableton to write and create everything manually yourself, right? Um, so when you look at technology, I foresee it initially as this enablement tool and you're, there's going to be friction right there's going to be marketing departments that get rid of creatives uh, some have even gotten rid of like 15 to 25 percent of their departments because they're using you know email automation um, campaigns and uh, just going on and on in regards to the generation of blog posts and everything else that a marketing department needs but similar to essentially what everyone's talked about um, my perspective or take on it is that when you look at LLMs, if you remember the, the bell curve from middle school, high school, that since they were trained on the, the corpus of all information, most people regurgitate information. Most information uh, that it outputs is from the top of that bell curve, right? It's the highest likely of pattern detection. But really, you want to be transformative or contrarian. You want to be innovative. And so by whether that's changing temperature or providing unique companies data, whatever the heck that is, 
it moves you more towards either of those tail ends of the bell curve. And then you're getting more of that creative spirit and embodiment of what you actually want in the output. This is great. I think we get nerd out on this all day long. Uh, We're about at time. Brett, I know you have a, a dying question to ask. Um, but yeah, we'll take a, a couple questions and, and wrap up. All right. Let's let the crowd, let's let the crowd ask questions first. Um, why are you concerned about intellectual property and, and innovation? Is there any? It's huge, especially in Europe, right? GDPR and all the creatives bring in the lawsuits against. I mean, yeah, they scoured the internet. They took intellectual property at no cost. You know, so yeah, that's the equivalent of you know, name your <laughs> civilized atrocity that's been done in the past. They're, they're just doing it now, and and so what. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it, I was always amazed. One of the things I learned in David's class was that when Amazon started working on AI, it took them eight years, on the better part of a decade, for that to really start showing return, for, for there to be productivity return. Boy, we could really speed that up if we just steal, just t t take whatever's out there, right, and, and add that to our model. So, and these are the things they're dealing with now. So, well, I was just going to say some of the most, um, I think you, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, I think some of the most interesting reading on the internet right now is the New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI and reading the briefs both sides had filed. You know, the, the question of, can you train your model on my data? You know, that we, we, as humans, we have this, of course, initial reaction. So that's not, that's not cool. But then the other side of the lawsuit talks about, well, if I listen to Taylor Swift songs as a human being for the next thousand hours, and then in the thousand and first hour produced a song in the style of Taylor Swift, um, is that a by in that really what our systems are doing? And it just these raises interesting questions, and I think these questions are going to be adjudicated. And you see different content creators with different perspectives on this. Many many companies around the world have done um, closed licensing deals with large language models, saying take our data, train on our data as long as there's a revenue exchange of sorts. So uh, raises really interesting questions. And I think in the years to come, you're going to see courts um, adjudicate some of these questions, uh, much like they did with the rise of uh, Web2. So, so yeah, that market's too competitive that like open AI, right. nobody, nobody's going to go under from that perspective. Right. Uh, I think the more unique aspect of that question is um, like the Scarlett Johansson, right? Where it's like, right. who is your identity and how much of that identity can others access, right? right? Because I could go train a model on any keynote speaker, any actor, celebrity from anything they've ever done, right? right. And then you can create a digital a ninety-eight percent match. Yeah. Is that enough to yeah? And so, like ethically, certainly no, right? But it's like the U.S. government has to shift at least to some degree stronger towards the GDPR aspects of that because if people lose their individuality, then who are we as people, and what's the point of all of it? Right. And then it accelerates into like education and cyberbullying just becomes. Way, way, way. I, real, real quickly, I'll just say there's a really fascinating startup, and I'll, I'll show you the, the link. It's called Wonder Search. And they, you know, like I go to archive.org to read all of the, you know, new papers that get published because that's my, you know, soft max manipulation to get random stuff. So they posted a paper this summer, just two people, um, and they used, uh, so again, gen generative AI is a very vague term. Nobody really knows category wise what it means. But to answer your question on intellectual property, is they basically use a genetic algorithm, more of an evolutionary process that did not train on anything. And so they created six songs, or sorry, four songs using this AI system, sent it to um, a bunch of different international record labels, then six record deals, and then told everybody it was AI. Um, and it had nothing to do with training, right? So part of it, it wasn't trained on everybody it's because music has a mathematical structure that, you know, the way that this, this system was set up, it basically, again, it's an evolutionary process. I mean, there was a human in the loop um, to some degree, um, but it did address some of these things. Now, whether you would put genetic, you know, algorithms, evolutionary algorithms in a generative AI banner, I have no idea. That's other people can decide that, um, you know, but it is uh, an example that some of the algorithmic sophistication that's emerging there are ways to move around some intellectual property issues. Just one more thing on this. I, I find it one of the other surprising but unsurprising observations I've had over the last couple of years yes. is um, humans have a far stronger authenticity radar than I would, you know, than, than we think. You know, these these systems have been alive. There have been something like 67 elections in the last year. And by and large, notwithstanding the creation of all kinds of um, 
chaos on these systems, you know, we, by and large, we've seen human humans able to detect from uh, what's authentic and what's not. And it gets to your point on sort of um, authenticity and uh, the edge. And then one of the things just on the intellectual property aspect, one, there, there's kind of two facets of that. Who owns the output, right, is a, is a big question, right? Um, you know, the Supreme Court has already ruled, like, I think, uh, over a decade ago that, you know, the product of an AI model, because it's not a human, does not deserve protection, so to speak, right? Um, and then the second aspect is there's a much greater awareness of the value of your own data now because of that. And so, and that's going to have follow on consequences, one of which is that you're going to see an increase, I'm going to say, balkanization of the internet. People are going to start locking down more. It's going to have to be in order for revenue sharing to occur and stuff. You're going to have to get access. So, and like that, that's a good thing, or it's hard to tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing quite yet. Should we tell them that our NFT? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, it, it is, but it's a, it's yeah, there is, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's, you know, programmatic ways of dealing with that there, but there's also just, you know, it's, it's a less free and open internet now, like you, I mean, you already started seeing that, you know, Russia and, and, and China are very much separate internets than the rest of the world. We no longer have this common operating picture as a globe and it's a, and it's a change and it comes from intellectual property, data lockdown, it comes like, they're all connected. You can't get away from that, but it's breaking apart. We're gonna grab one more question back. Yeah. Sorry. Um. So, a couple thoughts. Um. First of all, I wanted to say just as a, a customer who has been different to me changed my life. Um. What I'm able to scale now as an entrepreneur, quicker, faster, better, reverse engineer, it works, and build it for my own voice. Game changer. Um. Mm -hmm. um Ken, I work for the government in my day job, so I work in part with agriculture, specifically with chief scientists, and watching them slow walk their AI strategies and their structuring and very sad. Um, so I'm straddling two worlds. As an entrepreneur, I'm all in on AI. Yeah. And as a government employee, I'm crying. Yeah. And you're right, we don't even have the right people in the industry. Yeah. They have the, the fear of not yet. So my question for you, and one of the things I do in my own business is, um, I want to make AI more accessible to certain groups of people, um, specifically women who are in leadership with a voice and they have things to say. So I now exist in the content creation space and I'm trying to bring more women in there to amplify their voice. One of the key messages that I've been using, but I'm interested in hearing some other key messages you recommend from a psychological perspective is a key message I say is to women, mid to later career, AI, you are the best person situated for that. And who are we have experience in the industry? If you have enough work experience, you know, you don't need to do anymore because it's kind of a you come on in and your AI is for you. Um, do you guys have any other suggested key messages to make AI more accessible for women and for mid to senior career people who might be careful that I could start incorporating in my consultancy? Ask ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> That's always my first thing. Yeah. <laughs> See what's in. To me, you know, I'm a very big Mary Poppins fan. So, in, in, you know, in every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. Mm -hmm. You find fun, snap the jobs again. Make it more like play. Make it more like play. So, play with me. the music. technology of foolishness. That's it. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Yeah. On point. That's a, on, yeah. on the dot. So, I don't know. Again, people just need to use it. And, and it's not an age thing. And I don't think it's a gender thing. It's just how, you know, people, how afraid they are. Because there is a humanistic my wife was terrified when I made her watch that. I watched these two minute paper videos on YouTube. And when he went over the first, she, uh, I think it was three or maybe four, three that came out. She, how, was, uh, she was terrified. She, it, she, she felt I had kidnapped her and I did. I forced her to watch. Her. <laughs> and, and so there is a real fear element that people have. And, and so getting over that fear, I think the natural reaction part, the rational part of it is easy. It's the, it's the elephant, right? The, 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 the rider of the elephant, the elephant, the rider being the rational self and the elephant being the natural self. It's the nat it's the elephant you have to convince that. that you have to do. But I, th I think your question gets at kind of an opportunity, which is to say, notwithstanding the usability revolution uh, ushered in by GPT-4, GPT, the fastest app or website to 100 million users in internet history, sure. But there's still an opportunity for, for these products to feel more accessible, more delightful, um, 
And, and I, I suspect that when we do this conference in five or 10 years, and Apple, of course, has been thinking through, you know, they, they've historically been leaders in, um, you know, availability and accessibility and design and things like that. I suspect we'll be reflecting back on new products or new front, front ends of generative AI that are far more appealing and empathetic to users, not, not just women, but people around the world that haven't yet run towards these products. All right, I'm gonna let um, Brett do a lightning round question. We'll do it really quick and then we'll wrap up. All right, lightning round. Um, <laughs> so each of you, if you could give us maybe in like one second, what's what important truth about AI do either very, very few people agree with you on or do you feel strongly about? <clears throat> <laughs> AGI is not real. All right. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. Uh, AI should support and facilitate the human experience. The protagonists behind this revolutions, revolution are humans just like us. I think there's a strong tie here to philosophy because it gets into the notion of who we are as humans. Um, and I think it's we, we, I think there's a strong tie into philosophy and it's absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's just the word creativity and intelligence. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, because we're, we're having to attach this to AI, right. you really explore the actual spectrum of what that word means. Mm -hmm. We, we pay much more attention to meaning, especially when we're writing prompts and different things like that. So it, it is this kind of revolution in, of work. I, I would say so going back to what we've yeah, been doing is the exactly. humanities are yeah. much more important now than probably previously yeah. all right Dave Thanks. bring us up so my job is always as a chief heretic so they all triggered my heretic uh, <laughs> heresy so my my natural thing is just, it's just a, to give a contrarian view to each thing they said um no I I don't think there's much that AI is not going to be able to do but I think it's still you know it's it, we we talked we were talking about incompleteness at the beginning because we you know, we're nerds and yeah, we always have like weird there. discussions um, but that doesn't mean that there's going to be a super intelligence that is able to basically do everything and control everything. Right. So I, I have to give a citation to my question that came originally from uh, Peter Thiel, the book Zero to One. Yeah, so, yeah. what important truth do very few people agree with you on? So, I love the contrarian thinking. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Aaron, for running an excellent panel. How about a hand for all these? Thank you very much. Yeah, great job. Yeah, good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never done a panel. No, no, it's a pleasure, really. Yeah. So, are you in black screen? No, uh, 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to be here. Okay. 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 Yeah. Cool. I'll be down to me. Thanks for coming. Cool. You're, and yeah, what's your robotics suit for you? Uh, I'm mostly focused on counter yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. well, if, if you sensor yeah. networks, how do you, you know, provide situational awareness as you can do A lot of this next generation interface is yeah. all coming from the fact that I did testing yeah. with listed yeah. 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 and they had to find my interfaces. And I was like, oh, dear God, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so like, but that's that's that experience is like, how do we simplify? Well, it's just a very complex adaptive system. Like, well, yeah, like, uh, all of a sudden, you have something that can really, you know, tap into that. So, way I, I, a lot of the things I wanted to say, I just didn't to say, I mean, I guess this is the whole thing about Pam. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it really comes down to translation problems, right? Well, uh, and you kind of in general, right? Yeah. That, like, I don't know how much computers exist in our current position. I don't want to hear that now. It's like if the technology experience is going to shift, whether it's voice or AR, VR, but like, I think it's not going to be, yeah, it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are talking about okay. So, mm -hmm. so is that a very yeah, and uh, yeah, we have lots of web calls that they have right here. They're like, goes into the CRM. You were talking about like how you've automated into this one where you can say, okay, someone else is Yes. You know, generate the you know, topical recast email. Yep. 
how does that uh, on, on the ground how does that actually happen? Yeah, it's a it's builders by a group. So like we you know for recording we just had video of um upside of the CRM like that just correctly automatically flows like didn't say anything. Uh, then there's an application so yeah, just so for this example, right? We use a, a Zapier to run it through an LLM prompt um, and then embed that in our calendar. So it's like next to every every meeting, we have like a research or sales or kind of thing that uh, you can be right next to it. Uh, and then a company called Fixer AI is right next to ours that will um, actually now, we're not actually using this for this right now. They'll, they do really cool uh, aspects of regards to email categorization, right? Prioritization. Yeah. But, um, for, so we use Zapier for, uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. So my CTO directly wrote the API to the calendar for that aspect. And then we use Zapier to run for an LLM process that is my email directly. Uh, so like, some we built and it's just like already has connection. Some is like we had to full okay, build yeah. the APIs and yeah. other thing. Yeah. And sorry, it's like okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it yeah. depends on what you're gonna do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's very much like I mean I I do everything. I'm one of those those people that like to control everything. Yeah. Like, like, well, yeah. It solves my yeah. 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 But like even then, like your open source tooling is very powerful now, and a lot of it comes down to exactly what it's giving you. The API integration, right? Is very much what it is, and it's it's understanding what kind of flow you want. So they do right. So if you can structure that flow, like you've got an API flow guaranteed that you can buy or build, right? Like in, in, and that's really what it comes down to. I'm going to say, you're not building real frameworks that are designed to Google, like language, like scratch, like certain things like that are very straightforward. A lot of people are experimenting, right? It's very exciting. You get very explicitly, like my CTO is a data engineer, a data scientist, but like you can have uh, it. Like right up front. Oh, thank you, Spencer. Are you here, Blackfoot? Yeah. yeah. But you can have it like, say, like what you want to do, but, yeah. and if you're running specific coding languages, you want it like Python or something, so, yeah. and it'll create that. And then there's still like it'll get you 89 percent of like there's still all the hiccups of like connecting it and then figuring out the, you know or whatever it is. So, you, but like that's how he did like. I had the idea that I was like, look, I just do everything for the calendar. I do one that does any of task scheduling so that it goes to the calendar. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And so I want everything for the calendar. So my sales are recently going to go with the HubSpot. I want meeting recaps like the community action. I just like to do this. Yeah. And so, like, that's where I live in free. So we looked at integrating everything into the calendar. So, like, yeah, the one which you built. For the research, uh, uh, it took him like two days, and then like it was a bit of tweaking you know, over the course of a couple of days. But like it would have made it take it would take two days, like a day, right? Uh, right. First, like, probably yeah. get all three times. Yeah. So, so if you were gonna uh, kind of start yeah. in the basics, not really have all the you know the resources of the Zapier and the HubSpot, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, some of the sales more so on the CRM and you were using, you know, yeah. custom GPT, yeah. teach your sales model, load all your different presentations and your value proposition, yeah. business model, stuff like that. Um, um, what, what would you recommend? It could be just the, you know, the, the basics of getting some real product, you know, and uh, I I have people assess like what are pains like frustrations or really main efforts and like how repetition is it so you then can like assess what the cost of value is for like the time and you say you might get back from that to figure out eliminating the redundancy yeah. that people are just kind of yeah. 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 yeah so like even yeah ignoring even the darn bit of information when they dialing these things like what are those things and maybe it's like tons of manual email maybe it's like taking notes from LinkedIn and putting them in the spot or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Um, and if yeah, you're not building it from scratch, then I would still ask the chat GPT, like, hey, these things are eating up our lives. This is our tech stack. Are there any tools that we can integrate into 
And they don't provide regulation. Hey, okay. Okay. Actually, it works out good. Yeah. 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 So that's like the easiest way to start. Yeah, you're not going to like build all this crap from scratch, which is probably takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I started out in corporate education with Virginia Tech, um, working mostly with tech and bio. Yeah, this is um, better. Became a super nerd in how to work. So, college at Tech, got a master's in management. Yeah. 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 Um, but I'm going to now um, talk to our companies. One of the fun. Four years. I think so. That's all kind of new. So, in the job, I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. I love I love the. I just I just saw recently. Okay, that's great. There's something about writing posts. Yes, you see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're focusing here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of key numbers. Outside of the day. Right. Well, we're actually training. You know, so are you in the industry? Yeah. No, I would be curious. I didn't. No, I don't get it. Yeah. We're selling it. Yeah. Yeah. I want that. We're actually training. The fun thing we're going to do is back up and do all the science. It's always like, excuse me, like, we do this rigorously, physically, and at the end, they're always like, all right, Tony, we're just going to like, like, the same part. I kind of start shooting the grammar. I don't know if this is like, what do you mean? That's what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, if you're not, I will send it to you. That's her. That's her. It's a small start line. Here's the but you know, and in terms of guys, I was like pretty determined yeah. not to talk about like yeah, right. action, it's governance, a, or health. Like, like, this is going to be like. No, no, I can now. 
really strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We love the dark world. Those are second, right? Yeah. 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 I think about it. Yeah. So one of the things that the team can yeah. do is a human drive. A human drive. Right. Like first money. Like run into the sketchy city. And that's great for the company. Yeah. 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 Yeah.